<clears throat> Good morning, everybody. As you all know, the <clears throat> incidence of periprosthetic fractures is increasing, and it seems like it's increasing exponentially. The good news is we're getting more and more experience with them and more and more studies are coming out on these difficult fracture patterns. I want to start you with a case. This is a case we'll see. Um, we'll discuss it further during the uh, lecture coming up. I look at that x-ray and I see a periprosthetic fracture. I see relative osteopenia. I see a low fracture that may extend beneath the flange anteriorly. That anterior cortex on the lateral view may or may not still be in continuity with the distal um, bony block. And then uh, obviously there's a, seg a segmental comminution that uh, is going to play into the amount of stability available uh, to, uh, and what you can recreate. So keep that in mind. Nail or plate, what would you do for that? The goals of this talk are to really understand injury patterns and how they re may relate to the idea of nailing versus plating. We want to talk about decision making and then let's talk about modern techniques and how that may have evolved over the last 10 or 15 years. The Rohrbeck classification system is used for periprosthetic distal femur fractures above a knee replacement. It actually has some utility <clears throat> but it's pretty intuitive and you don't really need to be quoting the, the classification system per se. You just need to understand what it says. So there's three types. The type one is the non-displaced fracture with an intact, uh, stable prosthesis. Now, this is a very rare entity, and I, I really don't remember seeing a non-displaced distal femur fracture any time in the recent past. So most of these are displaced fractures. There's the type twos, and most of these, uh, the prosthesis is intact. So a type two has an intact prosthesis and a displaced fracture. So that's most uh, periprosthetic distal femur fractures. And then there's the type three. And the difference here is that uh, the prosthesis is unstable. So you have a loose implant. They may have been having uh, uh, preoperative pain. Um, maybe the implant went in 15, 20 years ago. So this is something you really have to talk to the patient about, and you really have to look for on, the, on a good lateral x-ray in most cases to see if this prosthesis is stable. And then there are a number of critical questions you need to ask yourself <clears throat> based on your examination of the patient and the, and the images. So number one, again, is the prosthesis stable? Uh, where, is the, where is the fracture located? What is the bone stock mostly distally? Because you're going to get, in most cases, plenty of bone stock proximally. What's the patient's physiologic age and their ability to endure a big operation or not? <clears throat> Do they have significant medical problems and comorbidities that are going to change your treatment plan. Do you expect this patient to walk once you've done your surgery? Do you think this patient will be able to control their amount of um, uh, protected weight bearing? And then what is the expectation for union? So there's a lot of questions here that are different than you would see with a non-periprosthetic or standard fracture or a fracture in a young patient. And then moving on to treatment. So Number one, do you need to and do you have the capability in your quiver to uh, revise a loose component? We, if we're going to fix it, we definitely want to shoot for anatomic uh, high quality reduction, either with a compressive technique or with a bridge plating. Um, and for that, you need to plan this out ahead of time and plan your fixation. And then we want to get early mobility, obviously. You can get grandma up and out of bed. So if you look at it according to the Rohrbeck classification system, you have a couple options above a knee replacement. Number one is a retrograde nail, uh, which has been tried for 30 years, and that's been a, it was a, became very popular, and then it sort of went away, and then as uh, implant design and techniques improved, uh, the retrograde nail is definitely back, and it's, uh, I think, very useful in a number of situations. The other option is uh, ORIF, and the other common option is ORIF, um, with a fixed angle device, so uh, modern lock plates are very commonly used for these, probably more common than nails, although that may be uh, trending back in the other direction. Uh, blade plates have been used, uh, dynamic condylar screw, but mostly modern lock plates. And then if you have a Rohrbeck III, an unstable uh, prosthesis, you should at least consider uh, revision total knee arthroplasty with or without use of a mega prosthesis. 
um, but not always. And occasionally, if somebody's having minimal pain and they're not, uh, and, uh, they're not quite the right person for omega, meaning they're relatively youngish, then maybe we should go ahead and repair these and expect to do a less um, uh, large-scale revision a little bit later once things have healed. So the question really is uh, nail versus plate, and we'll dissect that with a case or two here coming up. But for the displaced uh, distal femur fracture above the knee replacement, I think either one is reasonable in, uh, in more than 50% of cases. Okay, let's talk about fixation a little bit. So obviously if we're going to uh, use these implants, uh, we've got to use, get, get back to the basic principles. So, Alignment seems to be very important. We talked about this yesterday in the distal femur and uh, proximal tibia par portion of the lecture series. So alignment's very important, and there's a, a new multicenter trial coming out um, about distal femur fractures indicating that about a third, 25% to 33% of distal femur fractures are malaligned. That's incredible, right? So. And this is after the learning curve. It's no, we're no longer in the learning curve. We're out of the learning curve for lock plates and, and distal um, femur nails with retro, retrograde nail. So um, we really have to do probably better on alignment. Um, I think the other concepts you want to think about is maybe getting your uh, fracture reduced before you apply the implant. I think in general that's not a bad plan. Um, the femoral distractor is a, a good tool for that and get everything set up and then apply your implants to a reduced fracture. I think more screws are better than less screws and locking screws are probably better than non-locking screws or at least to some, some extent. You probably want to use some number of uh, fixed angle screws to enhance your um, stability. There are a fair number of cases, I'll, even that's not reassuring enough and I'll go ahead and I'll augment my screw fixation with some sort of calcium phosphate cement. And I think that's a, usual, a, a very useful tool, especially in the, in the distal condylar block where uh, the, the bone may be fairly vacuous and you're really struggling for fixation. So let's run through a couple of cases. So this is an 83-year-old lady. I look at this x-ray and I think, okay, it's displaced, but it's not horribly displaced. It's a very far distal fracture. And I think on the lateral view, you can appreciate that the fracture extends distal to the anterior flange of the implant. Um, so there's not a whole lot of bone to capture distally. Um, it's not highly comminuted. It's a relatively uh, stable pattern, at least compared to the, the uh, case I showed you starting off the lecture. So what do you want, want to do for this? If you go through our decision-making tree, uh, the prosthesis appears stable. The fracture location is concerning because it's so far distal. Bone stock, eh, not too bad for a periprosthetic. Uh, the patient's in reasonable shape. She's a, a fairly vigorous 83. Um, she does expect to walk again, um, and I think if we did a nice job fixing this, she could probably cheat a little bit on protected weight bearing, and then I would expect this to heal. So here we are in surgery. <clears throat> I used the femoral distractor. The C-arm's coming in from the other side. You can see on the lateral view in the upper left-hand corner that there's some extension of the condylar segment and we can maybe derotate that with a, with a joystick chance pin or something like that. Maybe move the bump and you, I think you can see in the right-hand picture uh, that the bump's been moved more distal and we've derotated the condylar segment. We're using a biologically friendly technique and we're going to use the, the radiolucent jig <clears throat> just to make, for the ease of screw application. You can see in the <clears throat> pictures on the left that in this case, I, I, because it's such a short condylar segment, I wanted to get some uh, improved fixation, some more robust fixation with the screws. So we're injecting some, some cement along the screw tracks. And this system has a cannulated screw system, so we're actually putting the screws in part way and injecting the cement through the cannulations. And then putting the screws in the rest of the way. And here we are post-operatively. I was happy with the reduction. In this case, she didn't need a 22-hole plate. She needed about a 9 or 10-hole plate. And uh, I was happy with the alignment. And she went on to do well and was ambulatory and moving around at four months. Bill Ritchie's written up a number of series about distal femur fractures, include, including periprosthetics. And what uh, that series showed was that uh, these people actually do fairly well. Uh, 98% of them healed. There was a couple problems with malalignment, as we talked about, um, and uh, about 
two, two thirds to three quarters return to full function. And that's not bad. Um, also out of that series came Philip Struble's follow-up article about how far distal can you fix with a plate. And it, I actually have some patience in this series. It's really fairly profound. You can fix extremely far distals with a plate. The, the plate fixation seems very robust. You can sometimes cheat the plate a little bit inferiorly to get, make sure you get four or five screws in that distal segment. And again, occasionally maybe you need to augment those screws with some cement. But only uh, three out of 61 patients failed in a, a series of extremely far distal uh, fractures. This is the case we started with. Um, comminuted, a uh, far a distal segment, but there does seem to be some condylar bone that we might tap into. The prosthesis was stable, the fracture location is a little concerning, the bone stock not as good as the first. Patient age and uh, uh, physiology is not bad, they expect to walk again and we expect union, although that's not guaranteed. So this one I nailed, and I look at this uh, post-op film and I'm still a little bit horrified by what I see. But this implant has four distal locking screws very close to the end of the nail. Um, they're fixed angle screws. You have a set screw. They all lock to the nail. So it becomes a, a, a robust nailing construct. And predictably, at five months, she's up walking, and she's uh, well aligned and very happy. There's a couple of uh, biomechanical studies saying that plates and nails are modern nails, and modern plates are um, different in how they act, but they're both stable. So they, there's more bending forces uh, applied to a plate, that's intuitive, but the rest of the um, stability of the implants is actually relatively similar. So there's a couple of studies out, both, said this, both say the same thing, um, that the uh, fixed angle uh, plates and the uh, um, nails are, are very similar in the amount of stability and what you get out of it. What you want to really uh, be concerned with in making the decisions is can you get a nail in if you're a nailer and you want to nail this? So if there's a box that you can't get through, obviously you're going to go with a plate. So you have to do your homework. You have to look at the x-rays, maybe talk to your implant uh, reps or talk to your implant partners uh, because you don't want to try to nail the, the, uh, uh, through a periprosthetic fracture with, uh, uh, on the right. And there's sometimes you may be able to cheat the nail a little bit posteriorly, um, uh, but that that is going to have some consequences. So if the, if, you, if the knee implant is pushing your entry site posteriorly, you can see the guide wire is forced posteriorly, <clears throat> that which brings the guide pin out anteriorly in the shaft. Your reamer path is going to be eccentric, and it's going to be aimed anteriorly. And you can see that as you put the nail in, there's a good chance that's going to swing your um, uh, fracture alignment back into uh, extension and end up with an extension deformity. So be careful. Last case I want to show you is uh, an 88-year-old lady. Uh, she's a little bit uh, ill. She's not a community ambulator. She's a home ambulator. Far distal fracture. Um, I think the uh, medial uh, uh, epicondyle is off. Um, so in this case, I think the prosthesis may or may not be stable. The fracture location is very concerning. The bone stock is concerning. Um, she's not that healthy, and uh, I'm not sure this one's going to heal. So in this case, uh, this gets a, a tumor prosthesis, and she's up and able to bear weight um, immediately. Uh, that's the benefit. The downside is if this fails, um, grandma's in a uh, world of trouble. So I think this is the one when you really can't fix it that, 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 that you go to, and um, I'm going to wrap it up there.